Hi, everyone. This is the FERC interest group session from 4.30 to 5.30. We have Dawn Dale. There's Dawn. Hi, Dawn. Hey, how is everybody? Good. How are you doing? Doing pretty good. Good. Um, I'm not able to share my screen, so I can't share the um, interstitial slide that the Evergreen Committee Conference Committee um, put together. But I will just thank our sponsors, Emerald, DataWorks, Equinox, and Mobius. And without further ado, since it's 431, let's start the interest group talk. Okay. Um, so I'm not sure who all is here, but um, I've done, I've been hosting the SARP interest group for a couple of years now. And um, I just basically come in and we just talk about things in interest SERP. So if you have something that you want to talk about, that'd be great. I did have a couple of notes here that I picked up earlier today. Um, I saw an email um, that um, was talking about scanned logins for, for library staff. I thought that was an interesting conversation. I don't know if any of the rest of you saw it. Um, but it came out on the Evergreen, um, through Evergreen emails. Um, kind of like you see at the hospital or your doctor's office where they walk up and scan their badge and open the computer. Um, I thought that was an interesting idea. Somebody did point out there might be um, some security issues um, tied with that because anybody could pick up a badge and scan, you know, scan it and be able to access the system. Um, but again, I don't know. That's something you'd need to talk over with your um, technology person, I think. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna use the chat here for. Um, do you think it's worth courtesy calls or expired holds? That's one question. Um, and Anita said about the scanning the cards of the library cards, they still have to put the pen in, which is correct. I agree with that, Anita. It doesn't just automatically open the computer. They still would have to put that in. Um, but again, that's something you'd want to talk with your security person about to make sure that, you know, you're not going to violate any security policies within your library. I thought it was very well worth the discussion and possibly even looking into downloading it and see if I can do something with it myself and decide whether or not it's something we might want to do. Um, I'm sorry, I did not introduce myself. I am Dawn Dale. I am the uh, Pines Specialist, um, Services Specialist for Circulation. And um, I've been with Pines now for 13 years. And so that's who I am. And I apologize again. <laughs> I just went right into it like y'all all know me. Um, <laughs> okay, so do you think it's worth do, doing courtesy calls for expired holds? Well, I think that depends on how large your library system is. Um, do you have the staff? Do you have the time to do that? If you have the staff and have the time to do it, yes, I, I think it's worth a courtesy call to say, you know, we really need you to pick your hold up today or tomorrow can you do that and if they can't then you, you say well we're going to have to send it back but i can replace the hold for you um so you know let them get it get back in line for it so um i definitely think it's worth it if you have the time and the staff for it or if you're lucky enough to have one of the automated calling machines to let people know you know you can leave um, automated messages for them um that would definitely be worth it. Um, Andrea says when she was a supervisor, we did courtesy calls for ILLs because they take a lot more overhead to get in for the patron. That's that's true, Adrian. Uh, uh, you have to, um, that does take a lot more overhead than the Pines ones do. Um, but again, if you have a super large library system, I don't know that it would be worth your time um, simply because you're, you're not going to have the time and the staff to get that done. Now, if you have a particular patron 
that is constantly not picking up their holds or um and they're going to expire then yeah i i might would um i might would call them just because that particular patron on a regular basis doesn't pick up their holds i mean i, I assume you're talking about expired as in picking them up not expiring as the hold is placed and the hold itself will expire is that right um da, 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 da. Uh, shay odom yes is that is that what you were talking about is is picking up okay good thank you um yeah, I think it's definitely, if you have the time, it's definitely worth it. Or if you have that one patron that just constantly is not picking them up, it's a good chance to do patron um, education on, you know, it does take time and money to get these holds here. And it would be helpful if you could pick them up before they expire kind of thing. You, you, you'll always have that one patron that won't do it, but, you know, still. Um, Tony says they have email, text and email notifications. Keen says, oh, what group was that discussion in? Referring to scanning of the security card. Checked my email and I don't see anything. Let me look at mine right quick because I kept it so that I would um, go back and look at it later. I think I kept it. Sorry, gives me takes me just a second here. Uh, Evergreen General scan logins for staff. It was it was in the general conversation. Um. Okay, yeah. So Tony said they have text and email notifications. Is there a way to send out emails through the system? Yes, there is. You can do um, action triggers, I think, and it will send out emails. Um, Marie says they do follow-up calls after a few days in case the text and emails didn't work. Um, she asked, um, can you send courtesy emails, text through the system? Yes. Um, and Andrea put a link to that, how that can be done. Tony says you should be able to set them up. And Taryn said, yes, via action triggers. So yeah, get with your system administrator um, and see if they can can do that for you. I mean, that's not something I can do, but I, I get with our system administrator and say, can, can we do this? And if we can, you know, we can. So, okay, until somebody posts something else, I'm gonna go to one other thing that I had on my list was credit card um, readers at the checkout desk that interface with Evergreen. Um, this is something I'm really interested in. We use um, credit card through the OPAC. Um, we use Stripe. A lot of people use PayPal or Authorize.net. There's, there's several that can be used. Um, we happen to use Stripe. And um, I would love to, to be able to have that at the CERP desk so that um, you know, patrons can walk up and pay their library fines or lost fees or whatever they have to pay um, without having to go over to a kiosk. Right now, a lot of our libraries have a kiosk set up near the CERC desk that if a patron wants to pay with a debit or a credit card, they send them over to the kiosk to log into their account to pay um, so that it interfaces with Evergreen and there's that not that chance of human error that, that removes the human error out of out of taking the payment entering into evergreen and then having to enter it into a credit card system separately so um that's something that I, I think that i mean you don't go into a store and they say sorry you can't pay with your credit card here i'd like to see us be able to pay with a credit card at the cert desk i think that would bring us into the current um uh, automated things that that we could do and and would help all of our libraries so um, if anybody has um, 
any ideas how to make that happen? Catherine says, I think that would require a big security development. Um, what do you mean, Catherine? Why would, why would it, um, and, and forgive my ignorance, why would it be um, a big security thing? If we already take them through the OPAC, if the patron could just swipe their card like you do at the convenience store. So you're not storing the credit card information. Yes. No, we're not. Stripe, Stripe handles all of that for us. They handle the, um, the, the credit card information never hits our server. It's all on Stripe and all in their system. So we don't have any of that. Um, and that's one of the things we did like about Stripe was that it, the information never hit our server. So um, I'd like to see, I'd like to be able to use Stripe at the desk as well for that. But yes, there are a lot of rules and forgive me again, I forget, I want to say API, but I don't think that's it. But there are a lot of rules um, around taking credit cards and having the information on your server. Um, there are a lot of things that have to be done um, for that. Uh, Kay says, do you have a minimum amount to purchase since there's a fee for a card reader? Um, we haven't actually gotten that far to, to discuss it. Um, through the OPAC, Stripe will not accept anything less than 50 cents um, because it for a 50 cent fine, it costs 35 cents. So they won't accept anything less than 50 cents, but we don't have a minimum of any other type. So, um, and we haven't figured out the, a way to add in a fee for using a credit card. So um, I don't know if that can be done or not with Stripe or through Evergreen whether we can add like a $3 convenience fee or something like that for using a debit or a credit card. We've had a couple of libraries ask about it, but we haven't, uh, we haven't been able to come up with that. PCI. Thank you, Andrea. <laughs> PCI compliance um, for development. There'd need to be a way, say for a card reader, oops, it's, it scrolled up. Uh, or a third party service to communicate with Evergreen staff client in a PCI compliant manner. It's not impossible, but as Catherine noted, the security lift is not minimal. Right. Um, and Stripe does, they, they handle all the PCI compliance for us because the credit, like I said, the credit card information never hits our server. Um, they handle all the PCI compliance. Karen says, I believe there's a wish list for that, but most businesses are moving away from that sort of thing. Um, the credit card readers at the desk, Taryn. Is that what you mean? No, adding on a fee. Okay. Yeah, I, I really think that all of our libraries that have used, have gone to using Stripe online have said that their payment their income from fines and fees and lost items has gone up significantly um, without even any advertisement, um, just the convenience. Tony says they have a scanner for the credit card. We have to enter the money, enter a money drawer account to process the payment, but the patron can then scan their card, but it's just a glorified barcode scanner. Okay. So you still have to enter it into Evergreen Tony and into the credit card reader. Um, it doesn't interface with Evergreen. So um, yes, I can see where that would be. Um, th that would also be better than, uh, you know, staff having to actually do everything, I guess. But um, I have a, I have an issue myself with um, you're at the desk and say the credit card reader is behind you on a shelf and you enter everything into Evergreen and you turn around with the patron's card in your hand. And in my mind, that leaves us open to you turned around and I could not see my card and I think you stole my number or you 
took a picture of it or you charged something to my card that shouldn't have been. Um, I don't like um, staff having to handle the card and I don't like them having to um, have the card out of the sight of the patron if they do have to handle it. It needs to stay in the patron's sight the entire time. Um, just for our own protection, in my opinion. I really hate when I go through a drive through and they take my credit card or debit card and walk away from the window. I don't like that at all. That makes me feel very uncomfortable. Um, I used a Discover card at McDonald's one time and somebody took a picture of the card and began charging things on my Discover card. So, um, Taryn says if they use something like Square, the patron can put the card in themselves or tap it. Yes, that's true, Taryn. Um, I, would, I would highly recommend if you're doing that, that you have something that you keep in front of you at the desk that the patron can do themselves and staff never have to touch the card. Cheryl says, oops, scrolled up on me. I have some concern. I have the same concerns. Then I get reminded that people are handling their cards, handing their cards to customer service people all the time. And I'm thinking about it too much. I agree with you, Cheryl. Sometimes I overthink it. Um, I was, I, I'm married to a former police officer and that's just kind of ingrained in me to, um, to think on the security side of things. And then if you've ever had it happen to you again, that just, I handed my card over to a service person and they took advantage of it. So yeah, you're overthinking it maybe, but you may not be. So I, I agree with you though. Um, Leslie says it is a minor annoyance, but is there a way to move the patron's address under the name at the top of the screen? It's at the bottom of the screen. So we need to scroll to the bottom. Um, we patron, with the same name, we often have to confirm the address if they forget the library card. Um, I don't know. Does anybody know if that is an option, if that that's a design option that we could look at? Um, I, I, I can see where it would be an annoyance. Um, having to look up their name to check out to them and then to verify it's the right person. We have just begun going, I mean, allowing patrons to check out without a card. And um, we've had a couple of times that the staff have checked out to the wrong patron. Let's see. Oh, Catherine said, if you want to speak, you can ask to share audio video and, and she'll undo you. Taryn says to make that happen, you'd need to change the code in the template, but it would be pretty straightforward. So if you have anyone on in your library that can code or in your a consortium or whatever you're with, um, if you have somebody that can code or a developer, um, Taryn said it should be pretty straightforward. Marie says we use MSB Nexus. It isn't connected to Evergreen and we only enter an amount. What money is what money is for and the credit card confirmation number. The patron scans or inserts their own card. Well, that's good. I'm glad y'all don't have to touch it. Uh, Michelle says it isn't currently an option, but we have customized it on our system. So I uh, assume you're talking about the address, Michelle. So they, they have customized it and it might be something that you want to get with Michelle and see if you can get the code from them that you can have put in your system and, and make it work for you. Heidi says you can do a search with the address and name at the same time. Yes, you can, Heidi. You can put in the search with the address. My problem with that is, um, if you don't type it exactly the way the person before you did, um, or if a number was transposed or mistyped or something like a street address, um, then you might, you might not catch it, but you can display the column with the address so that when you're looking up the person, you could make sure that the address is correct before you even select the, the person. 
Andrea said, pretty sure the template change would need to be global, i.e. consortium wide. And that's for the address as well. And, and I agree with you, Andrea, I think that would be too. Eva says, or you can set up a search result grid to see the address. Thank you, Eva. Um, thanks for the info. I may need to check since we are part of a consortium. Yes, you would want to make sure that your entire consortium wanted to, to do that. Michelle says the address is visible at the top of the patron sidebar and should the, the address visible at the top of the patron sidebar should be added to Launchpad. The discussion can happen there and the code can be posted there too. Thank you, Michelle. So open a Launchpad um, ticket. If you attended the, the um, introduction to Launchpad earlier, um, you should know right how to do that. Um, that was a very good session. But if you didn't, just get with one of your coworkers that does know how to do it. I don't have anything else on my list that I wanted to discuss, but I do I do want to hear what y'all want to talk about. What are what are your concerns? What are you dealing with? <clears throat> Is there something that um the rest of us can help you think through and maybe find a better, you know, a, a better workflow for, or. Okay, Cheryl said, at some point in the past, maybe before the web-based, I don't know, there was a way to change the patron information from the side of the screen vertically to across the top of the screen. We didn't like it that way, so I don't know how or if it can be changed back. There used to be a toggle button that you could toggle it back and forth um, between the side and and the top, and it was in the old Zool, Zool client, um, Taryn said, but you're correct. Um, I don't think very many people used, used it. You either liked it at the top or at the side. I don't think very many people toggled it back and forth, but um, it was a good option to ha have just in case that works better for you. you would then have the address that right there in front of you too. So where exactly do you set up action triggers? Um, Andrea or Taryn, do you want to answer that one? That's, that's beyond my expertise. And feel free to, to ask for permission to talk. Hello. Thank you, Andrea. Yeah, well, so the thing is, is that <laughs> I'm not an expert in it either. Yeah, where uh, it's located where Taryn says under local admin. Um, and there are a bunch of stock options, but like stock, uh, stock evergreen options for action triggers. Um, but they are um, can be a little bit of a rabbit hole if you're not sure what you're doing. And a lot of the language there is very unfriendly. Um, and very kind of developer oriented. So it might be the kind of thing if you have um, a support agreement or a system administrator that you can ask, you know, to help help you set those up. Um, I would strongly encourage you to contact your system administrator. It's um, creating action triggers is not for the faint of heart. <laughs> I would never even attempt it <laughs> unless I had more training. <laughs> yeah. And especially ones that involve patron notifications, because you definitely don't want to be sending your patrons like erroneous or miss it, like too too many kinds of notice notifications. Um, yeah, and Michelle, as Michelle points out, there's all kinds of other server requirements. You've got to be able to send email. You've got to understand like what um, different elements that they're they're operating on. There's all kinds of arcane language called hooks and reactors and validators, which makes sense once you know what it is, but it is, um, it can be a tall, a tall mountain if you're new to it. So I would definitely recommend um, reaching out to like your support or system admin if you have somebody that you can ask for help about that. It's not the kind of thing I'd recommend just diving into. Yeah. Test servers are so nice too. do it on a test server. <laughs> 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, as Michelle points out in the chat, action triggers love to send emails. Um, so even you got to be careful on a test server to make sure right. that if you're, if your test server uses real patron data, you got to be super careful that you don't send a bunch of notification right. emails to your test <laughs> right. patron, to your, through via your test server to all of your patrons. Like it's just, it's the kind of thing that's, it's a little bit of a technical lift to make sure you're, you're doing it um, correctly. It would be, there'd be a great opening for some kind of simple action notifications feature to be built, but that's not a thing yet. Angela says, would you, would asking about the in transit list be appropriate for this group? Yes. Yes, of course. What can we ask you, help you with? If you're not familiar, you're in transit, sort of the items that are in transit between libraries and, um, you have a list of in transits and how long they it tell you how long they've been in transit and that sort of thing. I have a suggestion of it being changed to two different tasks, one for county, another for out of county. Um, so if it's in transit for out of county, how do you designate that? How do you know that it's out of county? Angela. Our consortium, we have codes for all of our libraries um, and it entails the entire state of Georgia. So um, we can do a sort by library code. Oh, you're in Pines. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, Angela. <laughs> I didn't recognize your name. Um, you can sort your list by the library codes once you pull it out and put it in Excel. You can, you can sort it by library codes and then you could do, um, you could do your, your searches in different ways. Does that help? I do that, but it's time consuming. Hmm. Okay. Anybody else have a suggestion about a, a different way to, to sort the in transit list that would help? Um, and a handle out of county very differently than in county of, of the ones that are in transit, right? I can see where you would. Um, do you, I assume you have your own local courier that, that handles your in county transits, okay. Um, and then of course we, well we, not of course, but we use stat courier and um, yes, Angela's in <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, we use stat courier for our statewide courier. Um, a, re a reoccurring report might be helpful. Yeah, you could set up a reoccurring separate report um, for the differences, for the things that are different, and then you would have two separate reports instead of just going to the in transit list in the menus. Would that help, Angela? Okay, well, we can, um, if we can help you set that up, let us know, okay? Um, you can put in a help desk ticket and we'll, we can talk about it further and, and see what else we can do. That's my ink pen. <clears throat> Anybody else have a question or something you want to talk about? Taryn says you could also set up an Excel macro to do your sorting for you. <clears throat> There are a couple of people in Pines that are really good with Excel um, that could probably help you set up that macro if you're not familiar with that. I'm not one of those people, but uh, Tiffany Little is great with Excel. Also, um, uh, Christina Trotter is also good with Excel if you know who she is.
Has everybody um, opened their libraries back up since the pandemic? I know we in Georgia have, and I was just wondering if, if the rest of the country has gone back to a semi-normal state of workflow. Good. I'm glad to see that, that, that people have. I'm coming from the patron side in Maryland, but I, everything's back to normal in Maryland as well, as far as libraries. Uh, some people still haven't gone to full, full hours yet, but I think that might be a staffing issue. Yeah. Um, as compared to pre-pandemic. Right. Staffing in, in any business is just here in Georgia. I assume it's that way across the, across the country, but staffing in any industry is just difficult right now. Um, they just don't have enough staff. So, um, how many of you use the um, um, da, 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 curbside pickup module? Did you like that? Yeah, Washington's still having limited hours due to staffing. We did use the um, curbside module and it was um, a little cumbersome at first, but once you started using it and got used to it, it really, it really did work pretty well. Um, when you took the, when you said the patrons here, it automatically checked the items out to the patron. You didn't have to go back into the patron account and do them one by one. Um, so it was a little bit cumbersome at first, but um, uh, Terrence says we still have one or two libraries using it. So, I mean, some, some a couple of our libraries did decide not to do away with it. That they Their patrons liked it so well um, that they kept it. Uh, you know, the sleeping baby in the car. You know, you can't run into the library and leave your sleeping baby in the car, and you certainly don't want to get them out and wake them up. So, um, so yeah. yeah, go ahead. Angie. Angie. I was gonna say Angie uh, Devers and from Pales is gonna be um, Mayus. Uh, we'll be gonna be talking about their experience with curbside on. Hold on, I had it on the schedule, but I just lost it. Thursday. Oh, okay. Thursday at three. Um, okay. They'll be talking about um, Mayus's implementation and how how they you know made made it work for them and stuff like that. So great. Great. If anybody is interested in that. Yeah, I'll, I'll watch that one. Um, let's see, what else can I think of here? Uh, Bradley Bonner said, we used a third-party curbside product from my Libro. It was meh. Would try the module if I had more time to plan. Yes, the timing, there wasn't a lot of time to plan. Um, you, we had to just jump into it when we opened back up, even partially. Um, so that was difficult. Um, we did do some testing of it in-house um, in, in the Pines office before we sent it out to our libraries and said, okay, this is what you need to do. Um, this is how it works, whatever. Um, Taryn also coded different time frames instead of just a two hour window. She coded us like a 12 hour window so we could see for the day what was, who was coming in, that kind of thing. That helped people plan a little bit better. Yeah, there is definitely, cause like, we slammed that out we equinox in like i think it was six weeks from like literally the first email i sent to community members being like hey we're going to do this is anybody interested um and when we literally deployed it for our customers um mm -hmm. so there is definitely a lot of ways like if this had been a normal project there are a lot of ways a lot of feature improvements a lot of uh, flexibility that could have been built into it from the start mm -hmm. but it was um just kind of like get something out that is mostly working it right. is for the time as possible. From, um, from the good old days of beginning Evergreen, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, now. no, it was very much like that. And um, 
there's been all kinds of great and actually as part of that presentation on Thursday, I know that they're going to talk about it. There's a whole list of, of potential future improvements um, for cur that could be done for curbside that, that I think Angela is going to be sharing just oh, ones great. that I've, I've gathered over the years. Um, so I, I'd like to see it developed out a little bit better. So it would be more convenient because that would yeah. be um, a, a good feature to keep for our patrons if it's convenient enough for our staff. We have to make it worth the time and effort that we put into it as well. Um, Cheryl said she went ahead and opened a launch pad ticket on the address, on the patron address thing. So if you want to want to add heat to that ticket, she put it in chat. And um, the more heat it gets, the sooner it'll get looked at. <laughs> I think the, the pandemic changed the way we do so many things that um, life as we once knew it, I don't know if it will ever be back to what as life as we once knew it. One of the biggest things for me is Walmart and Kroger are not open 24 hours a day. That kills me. I used to do my grocery shopping at 11 o'clock at night <laughs> when nobody else was there. Um, so, you know, I don't know if things will ever go back to what we knew as life as we knew it so um yeah that was especially useful when i was in grad school and working full-time and like that was when groceries got shopped for it was at right. 11 o'clock at night <laughs> yes uh, taryn says she mostly does curbside pickup on her groceries and you know a lot of people do that a lot of people do um so not only does it save you time it saves you money because you don't have those impulse buys buys Um, so we, that, that's a feature that I, you know, there's a lot of people that might really still be interested in if it was more convenient at, at the libraries and for our staff. Um, and we could, could help our patrons and, and in the, serve our patrons in another way. Um, we're going to have to keep looking for new ways to serve our patrons, I think. What other questions do you have? Okay, Bradley said, we made a local change to move the address to the topic at KCLS. We'll ask Bill to look at that ticket and get it out. That would be great, Bradley. I was actually wondering, Bradley, because I know that Bill's been rewriting that entire interface, the, the patron. He actually, I think, wow. just put a new updated branch out this morning or yesterday, pretty recently, if that was something that was included. Yeah, that toggle button would be nice to have back. I'm sure it's not as simple as a toggle button, so... <laughs> Um, Leslie says, yes, that was, that's what we do as librarians, be flexible and adjust services as needed. Right. Um, and Bradley says, which toggle, there used to, back in the old Zool client, Zool client be a toggle button to change the patron information from down the left side to across the top of the screen. Um, and that, that's the toggle button we're referring to. Cheryl says, starting in April of 2020, I began registering patrons for accounts online. All their information was sent to me directly, and I created accounts, emailed their credentials so they could start using electronic resources. Everyone wanted access to the digital library and then mailed their cards. Um, when I was working from home, I could handle all this. That's, that's a great alternative, Cheryl. Uh, we actually moved to um, a company called Kipu, and actually they're one of our sponsors in the, in the um, vendor hall. Please visit them. And they picked up our online registration. We're doing online registration through them, and they um, emailed the patron all their information for using the, the 
um, library digitally. If they want to come in and check out books, they do have to come in and actually get take their digital card and get a get a, a actual card. Um, the the digital card, the physical digital card, doesn't actually exist. They just have their number and then their pin number. Um, but they can come into the library and say, I have a digital card and I'd like to get a, a regular card. Um, we wanted to keep a person to person contact so they'd know who to reach out to for questions. They had my name, phone number and email. That's great, Cheryl. That's, um, and it did, I'm sure it helped a lot to be able to give you um, work to do so you could work from home. Um, Yeah, I know that Kipu can do a bunch of different things with the form too. So they may even be able to put like a staff members, you know, if you have questions, right. contact the, you might be able to like kind of hit the middle of that personal connection. They will, whatever you also want help to, me to say. Automate. Yeah, whatever you want to say in the email, they'll put in there basically. Eva says during pandemic library closure, we started to send ordered, ordered books to patrons address by post or delivery service and later we decided to keep this as a regular service. Does anyone else do it similarly? If so, what's your workflow? Um, and then Taryn said we have an action trigger, an email that we send out with action triggers that we could control in the wording. So the wording of the email from Kipu is we control that. Um, Eva, um, we have a couple of libraries that actually do books by mail for, for say senior citizens or um, maybe an adult that doesn't drive or something like that. If it's not somebody who's physically disabled necessarily, um, like books for the blind or something like that. But um, we do have a couple of libraries that do send out things through the mail and I believe they use the postal service. Um, I don't know what their workflow is necessarily, um, how they know which books to pull for the patrons and that sort of thing. But if you're interested, you could email me and um, I will find out. Um, I know that one of our Hall County libraries that is the county that I live in actually does that. Yeah, there's definitely room in Evergreen for like that home delivery module. I know that Koha uh, has something like a whole kind of process to help them manage that um, and manage the patrons who get this service and like even um, do things like patrons can can tell you what like their favorites are and things like that. Like there's definitely room for some future development there for something similar in Evergreen. Yeah, I think so too. Um... Taryn says when she worked in Orlando many years ago, they used the U.S. Postal Service to send out books. They had a whole department to do the packing. It was expensive, but they circulated as many books as a large library branch and was cheaper than running a branch. So that's a good idea. Yeah. What I miss in Evergreen is the ability to add a note to holds. This would help. Okay. That, um, that was from Eva. Um, yes, when you place a hold, you can't add a note to it, can you? That would be nice. Maybe you need to open a launch pad, a, a wish list for that to be able to add a, a note to a hold. Um, there may be many uses for that sort of thing. I don't know. Oh, you found one, Andrea, that's already out there? I think so. I think that's saying a similar thing. There is, um, as Anita noted, there is a hold notes field, but it's it's kind of buried. Um, and I think what this wish list bug it gets at is having that available. Like at the time you place the hold, you can put a note. Well, so add heat to that. Go in there and add heat to that um, to that bug. So that um, you just click on the, the thing that says, does this affect you? And you click on it and that adds heat to it. Um, down at the bottom of the whole detail screen, you might make it visible to print on the slip. You can make it visible to print on the slip. So down at the bottom of the whole detail screen, 
you can make it visible to print on the slip. Um, I'm not sure which which screen you're talking about, Anita. Okay, catalogers do this because sometimes you can't remember why you placed a hold to begin with. I can under, I can see that definitely. Um, Beretta said that she had a problem where it wouldn't print on the receipt even if selected. Yeah, that's probably a template issue. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, templates are great, aren't they, Britta? <laughs> they are very joyful. We all, we all feel that pain. <laughs> she says they haven't had the problem yet. Um, maybe you could get with her and see what their template looks like and could um, kind of steal some of her code for the template to make yours work. So I was going to say that in the time between when I posted that bug and now it's heat jumped from 16 to 28. So good job, guys. Yes. <laughs> yeah, you, you all attended the class earlier on Launchpad. Yay. <laughs> um, well, that'll, that'll get some, uh, some, some notice then. All right. And then Cheryl said, we started com something called Book Fix for patrons who didn't know specific titles, so we're unable to put traditional holes, but wanted a select wanted their selections by topic or similar to another author they liked. They would send us their parameters and the library staff would search and bundle place hold on, on these so patrons got notices as soon as available. Those without internet capability could call and do the same thing. Well, that's interesting. I've not heard of that. For that person that comes in and says, it was blue. The book was blue. <laughs> And the cover had this on it. <laughs> when I worked for a very small rural library, we did something similar. It wasn't like an official program, but we definitely had PR, some regulars who wanted that. They didn't want to pick. It was the people who'd like read the whole library, right? <laughs> right. Or they'd read everything right. by their favorite authors. And they just, you know, would give the reference staff some parameters and the reference staff would get creative with the suggestions and the, they actually, the reference people loved it. It was a, a fun, creative exercise. Yeah. I didn't think I would ever get to the point that I'd read like all from my favorite authors, but I finally did and had to start looking for other authors. So when patrons were worried about coming in and we didn't want to lose contact with them, this kept us in touch. That's good. That was, that was a good way to do it. Yeah. I think there's still some patrons out there that are still worried about coming in or going out into public places and handling items that somebody else has handled and that sort of thing. I think there's still some people that are a little bit um, gun shy about getting life back to as normal as possible. Bradley says, that reminds me during curbside, we would bundle a bag of books for sur surprise bags thinking about continuing that. Do any of you do similar and how do you handle the bulk checkouts and check-ins? Cheryl said they did book bundles as well. I've never done a surprise bag. Anybody else done that? Pulled a bunch of picture books. Some branches are still doing it. I know it's a big thing with kids toys right now. Surprise. What did you get? You buy a round ball and you don't know what you're getting, but hey, surprise. <laughs> that does sound like an inter interesting feature for the person that's read the whole library and maybe just needs an introduction to something new. Do you have a good way to check them out easily, quickly? Uh, Catherine said we had one of our libraries do a mystery date with wrapped covers. Um, so patrons couldn't see their covers and not a batch of items. And Cheryl says they just scanned them as usual. Marie says the only time we do something similar is date with a book. So this sounds like some pretty good programs. I 
Riley said, Cheryl, thanks. I'm exploring a way to print scannable barcodes to a receipt to attach to the bag. We'll see. Okay, that'll be interesting, Bradley, to know if you get that done. And Cheryl says, blind date with a book. And then Marie said, we write the barcode on the wrapping for checkout. I know that barcodes are, are, are not like, they're not expensive, but they're, it's still, um, they still cost money and some of our libraries don't have money. Um, but I know at Hall County, we had a barcode printer um, in our, in our uh, processing department that you could print duplicate barcodes to stick on, that that would be a way you could do it to stick on the outside of the wrapping instead of writing them so that you could scan them instead of hand typing them in. Um, all you had to do was scan the original barcode if it was still scannable to print a duplicate. I found out the barcode machine staff are using like, sorry, you're typing faster than I can read, 70, each, 70 cents each, so thus I asked for a receipt method. We'd love to hear more about printing scannable barcodes. We wanted to do that with our hold slip so that we could just scan the barcode from there when the patrons forget their card or we're taking them curbside for them. Um, we wish the mystery, we did the mystery date book too, and mystery bags usually by genre. We would write barcodes on the back or the bag. We do bundles at checkout. We do bundles, but the checkout can read the RFID tag to check them out. That's good, Tony, if you do have RFID. Scannable barcodes on receipts was popular during COVID. We had some libraries configure receipts to do that. Anita says that's how we're printing the login out for staff so they can step up to the computer with their login and just enter their PIN, and bingo, the computer is ready to go. Oh, so you already do some type of scannable login. That's great. I know that when I had my library card and, you know, library cards do wear out after a while and my, my card got to where it wouldn't scan and I didn't want to get a new card number because I'd already memorized that one. So I went to the processing department and put in my barcode for my card and printed me out a sticker and stuck it on the front of my card. <laughs> it still works. <laughs> Scannable barcodes on receipts. There was some discussion on mailing list at Georgia Library's Mark Mail. Okay. Thank you, Michelle. Bradley, you probably would find that interesting. And if for some reason you don't have access to that, Bradley, let me know and um, we'll, we'll get the the, at least the discussion for you, or we'll try to. I think the more that we can, can bring our libraries up to um, automation type um, production for our staff, being able to scan in their barcodes instead of having to type them in if they don't use a username that's um, most most libraries want you to use a pretty, you know, a username that's longer and not something real short that somebody can guess. Um, then yeah, we um, I think that we should try our best to do as much as we can to become as automated as possible, um, because staffing is an issue, and that saves staffing time. Um, and it will just leave us open to do other things like reshelve the books. <laughs> we have about five minutes left for some more questions and discussion. Okay, great. I really was worried about it going an hour. Um, Marie says, just curious, is there a way to see a patron's history for those patrons who request that we pick books for them. You can run a report 
um, Marie, you can set up a report to run that will tell you what the patron has checked out. It has checked out in the past, you know, their, their CERC history. And if you don't do reports, yeah, if it's enabled. Um, if it's enabled on the patron side, the patron can see it, but I think staff can run a report if they have permissions. It's the, the source would be under patron and well, I'm not sure. I'd have to look at that. It might be under circulation, but I know that there are reports that can that we can run. Um, the report can. Taryn says the report can be and can be whether it's enabled on the patron side or not. He says some systems we do anonymize the circs after a time. How long is that time, Bradley? Um, Marie says the only issue we've been with Evergreen for only two years and we have patrons for 60 years. True, you would only be able to get two years worth of data. Yeah, and that's one of those where there's a d definite um, discussion to be had about patron privacy versus patron service right. and where, where right. you, you want to draw that line at your, in your community. I would think you would need the patron's permission to be able to look at their history like that. Um, currently a year. So like in Bradley's system, they anonymize them after a year, they would only be able to get a year's worth of history. Um, but I guess that would still give you an idea of what the person likes to read. Um, we don't have access to history. I don't want to access history. I can understand that, Cheryl. I would. I can understand that completely. If they opt in to keep their, the history, they don't get anonymized. Okay, so they can opt in still on their side and they don't get anonymized. Um, Taryn says we were created the report to answer the patron questions because they encountered the bug where their history won't download if it's too large. So that's why we created the report. Cheryl says they can choose to keep their history within their account, but staff can't see it. Right. That's true. That's true. So, okay, we are about times up. Um, Bradley says at Taryn, yeah, Biblio Commons seems to limit how much history the patrons show. Okay, so there's a lot of different things here, um, and the um, I'm going to uh, copy and copy the chat so that I will have it because it doesn't come out with the um, with the um, recording. So I'm going to copy the chat so that we will have it. And um, if you have any questions or um, anything else that we can help with, please by all means. Don't hesitate to contact any of us. Yeah, Thank John, you. can you drop your email in the chat? So that yes, let me do that right now. Thanks. Thank you. And then is there an upcoming meeting of the group? Um, I haven't scheduled them in the past. I am going to try to do better. Um, I, I will see about scheduling a meeting and I will have all of your names. I'll try to get um, all your contact information, but I will have all your names. Um, I'll find you one way or the other and let you know. Um, I'll see if I can start scheduling a regular meeting that we can have um, monthly or quarterly or something like that. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Sounds good. Okay. All Thank right. you, everybody. Have a Thanks. great night. Thanks, Thank Dawn. you all so much.